Yes, hello, and welcome to Release the Creative, your favorite show about cognition, creativity, and today, pitch, pace, poise, pause, and punch. I hope everybody wrote that down. Pitch, pace, I can't, dang it, I was going to like nail it the second <laughs> time, but pitch, pace, pitch, pace, poise, pause, and punch. Other people add projection to that list, and we'll talk about what that means later, but uh, I don't agree that projection belongs. How on. many people add Peter Piper pick to pick of pickled peppers? <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah, other people, yeah, so pitch, pace, poise, pause, and punch. But, well, yeah, now today we're talking about how important your voice is to communication. And now we all say a collective, duh. <laughs> well, I'd look, maybe we'll do a little bit of how instead of just... <laughs> yeah. No, it's true. It's, I mean, if you think about it, like, people say, love to repeat this myth, super duper repeat this myth of, you know, um, you know what you say is only like X percent of, of communication. And it's absolute garbage. But how you say things is remarkably remarkably important to to uh the words and i will say that the words alone are are a fraction of what is being said and i mean even if you take out the body language the words the 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 pitch the pace the poise the pause and the punch of the words can can change a lot of how we of how we receive communication yeah like if i were to scream at like scream at a girl you're beautiful like she probably wouldn't take that like yeah you know, a lot of people uh love uh if we're trying to not be cruel pet owners, but yeah. our pet has frustrated us, yeah. it is uh, a common technique to to maybe uh, keep your tone of voice friendly, but maybe yeah. say what you're really thinking. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah, then, exactly. Yeah. Um, when I was in film school, I had this teacher uh, um, whose name was Mark. I don't remember. It was like Mark Pinto or Mark Pilaf or Mark. It was some food item that started with a P. Um, gosh, what was his name? We'll call him Mark Pepper. <laughs> Mark Pepper. I really liked him, though, despite the fact that I can't remember his name. Um, and he was one of the first people that introduced me to the concept of sound design. Now, as you would know, I'm not a sound designer. I have no particular talents in this. But he was the guy who introduced me the concept of sound alchemy, if you will. Yeah. And his particular uh, field of, of profession was video games. You know, because if you think about this for a second, like with a movie... Oh, you need someone walking down the, the street? Well, let's go get the sound of someone walking down the street. Or, hey, wind through trees? Cool. Get a microphone, wind through trees. But but video games start with nothing. There's nothing. There's no... There's, there's nothing. And so everything from what does the gun sound like in this game to what does... What does the, the floors as you're running sound like? You know, these all have to be either captured organically or like... Made up. Made up. Um... You know, same things with sci-fi. If you think like Star Wars, what does a lightsaber sound like? Like <laughs> that had to be entirely organically thought yeah, of. That's what makes one sci-fi movie unique from another. Right. You know, exactly, exactly. And a lot of this comes from this world. And I remember him telling this story that really stuck with me about how he was hired um, to to make um, the sound, the, the music for these different levels. And one level was being played uh was on a beach in Russia. So they said, we want a background that is Russian beach music. <laughs> and he's a, uh, for, I mean, for reference, he was a uh, Eastern European Jewish individual. So he's like, I grew up in very European music. He's like, okay, so what makes European music and, and Eastern European, like Russia, what does Russian music mean? And how would that be different than, you know, Jewish music of my youth and, and American music and specifically beach music? And what is the fingerprint of of those musics and so he and he played it for us he's like what does this sound like we're like sounds like russian beach music actually like you crushed it man <laughs> and the concept of of a meter can have a personality and a, a rhythm can have a personality and nowadays that we have epidemic sound and all these sound libraries and you can now that's a really common concept but for me at 21 before a lot of that existed it wasn't something that was in my head but what a lot of people still don't understand is that your voice does that exact same thing. There are branches. There are, if you want to sound like a reporter, you know what to do. Like tonight, if you want to sound like a, ma uh, a, a, a monster truck, you know, Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. There are, there are genres that you can apply. And what's crazy is that within a certain culture, we are so programmed to that, that if you can, if you can click onto that tone, you can kind of borrow some of the, the the emotional resonance just like jewish not jewish not russian beach music yeah you can borrow that if you can if you can copy the tone and such yeah i've been uh 
I'm primarily a video editor, but uh, I've been asked to do a fair number of voiceovers in my life. And yeah, usually what I start with is, well, let's find something similar and try to replicate that. No, ex- you know, exactly. And and you and I, I remember last year or oh, gosh, like a three years ago, someone came in and they had this great video and they're like, oh, my mom's a voiceover artist. She did the voiceover for us. And they were a young male AV company and the mom, which we didn't know, was a she sounded like Mary Poppins. She'd been born in England. <laughs> and so suddenly you had and it just didn't. I mean, beautiful it voice, beautiful. But yeah, it didn't beautiful match voice. But it, seriously, like, I mean, if she if they were like extreme nanny service would have been perfect, but it just didn't work. So we're like, we have to we this it's the voice is too old. The voice is too, uh, not female. Female wasn't the problem, but he was just far too proper. It was just not, it didn't work. And it's not about a matter of good or bad. It's a matter of like, but in that case, we had the option of stripping the vocals and put something in. But in general communication, when you're talking to your boss, when you're talking to your friends, when you're talking to your kids, when you're talking to your dog, you only have your voice to go with. So you can't be like, excuse me, can I get a can I get someone else in here to get, get a, the dog? Get a ringer in here. Yeah, like you're you're stuck with your own. And and a lot of people don't. They're like, well, I said it as nicely as I could. And I was like, well, first off, that's either terrifying or just not true. But what really helps is if you break down what those those elements to to speaking are and and like i said at the beginning it's pitch pace poise pause and punch and if you can not necessarily master but just at least be aware of those five things you can mimic and or master or or take full advantage of of a lot of latitude in human communication so let's go through these slower what was the first p pitch pitch so okay is a singing thing, right? <laughs> you would think so, but no. Um, I mean, yes, they certainly do use uh, pitch in singing. So say something in your normal voice. Uh, say any sentence. I enjoy buying peanut butter. I'd like to point out that you just changed both your I pitch. Did. I your changed voice. everything. You changed everything. It's really hard. It's really hard to be asked to uh, <laughs> do something differently. So here, now, now I'm in the zone yeah. where I'm talking like Jeff talks. And right. when Jeff talks like this, this is this is actually, you would say, not my <laughs> telephone voice, not... Uh, you, you are putting on a voice that isn't yours at the moment. Bit, but yeah, it's, 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 real it's really hard, hard when you're sitting here with the microphone. Yeah. Um, let me try this one. <laughs> Hey, Kirk, where do you want to go for lunch today? That was your normal voice. There we go. It's really hard to do your normal voice. Okay, now with changing absolutely nothing, just say that higher. Hey, Kirk, where do you want to go for lunch today? (laughs) Uh, Well, you weren't wrong. Now say... (laughs) That was awesome. That was your Mickey Mouse, Jeff. Okay, now say it. Oh, no, no, no. I can. <laughs> okay. Let's let's see here. <laughs> Without going falsetto. Don't go falsetto. Yeah, no, That's they, cheating. That, yeah, fal- falsetto's easy. Yeah. But um, the- that was a really good Mickey Mouse for oh, the record. Oh, hey, kids. Hi. Uh, <laughs> let's go to the clubhouse. It's time for Mickey Mouse Clubhouse. Uh, falsetto is fun. But yeah, you're asking. I had no idea you had that in your bag of tricks. <laughs> Zero clue. Yeah. No, that's a, I can I can do that one. Okay. But um, but no, let me let me just go up, up and. And this is about as probably as high as I could go before it gets into falsetto. When would you use that tone in a real life? There, I don't know. Very rarely. I, have you heard me do it? No, that's yeah. why I, I, that I, was actually a lot higher than I thought. Okay, now now go lower again without going to like, like yeah, yeah, without no, on and that, that comes into when when someone says, "Well, we need a voiceover with a serious voice." I'll I'll come down here, and sometimes people tell me, "Well, that's too too low. You need to be okay." The an- the anatomy of that how. What did you just do? So thinking, anatomically thinking, thinking through it now, it, it feels like low voice is is here. Like I'm, I'm a low voice. And then when I come up, 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 I, I kind of hear. Right. Uh, yeah. So that's You're using different parts. Of it. Yeah. So, yeah, what I like to say is like right now I talk with the front of my mouth. This I talk mm-hmm. way. I, I talk basically right behind my teeth. And if I want to uh, if I want to resonate more or put on my sexy DJ voice, I just talk with the throat. And by talking with my throat and moving it back here, I can command a lot more resonance. I'm not actually pushing the tone down. If I want to push the tone down, that's a different thing. It involves neck muscles and such. But really, the real pitch isn't as much in pushing the tone down. It's just talking with the back of your throat, as opposed to talking behind your teeth, which is what I'm doing now. I can just move it back. And everyone can do this. This isn't a Yeah, you don't, you don't uh, think of it that way. But now that you've said it, I'm going to go to the back of my throat and then I'm going to come to the front of my throat. And yeah, that that's actually a different high than I did it is. earlier, isn't it? It is. Yeah. And and one, like, one is like, you'll say, it's like, speak higher. And a lot of people do kind of what you do. They get into this, like, a little bit of a helium. And what they're doing is they're they're cutting off some of their lungs and they're... they're t- but if, if, 
actually more you think about this like it's a tennis ball <laughs> tennis ball it's like a it's like a bb and you're moving your voice around the biggest thing to making a deeper resonant pitch is just talking with your throat as opposed to with your teeth and that can get and uh again chris foss is one of my favorite authors well he's a he's a hostage negotiator uh by trade and then he went and became this like uh he founded this thing called the black swan group and he talks about it being his jazzy late night dj voice when he needs to when there's a hostage a situation or there's someone who's overly emotional or overly frantic you just go you just take it down a notch and it tends to bring people down you know i just learned a new fact here next time someone that hasn't met you said asks me what's kirk like i'm gonna lead with the fact well one of his favorite authors is a hostage negotiator and i think that says a lot (laughs) damn that does actually say a lot about me that Chris Voss, by the way, never split the difference. Best book ever. I've read it uh, multiple times, and it is, in fact, written by Chris Voss, a former hostage negotiator, one of my favorite authors. Wow, that does say a lot about me. <laughs> my other favorite author is Tony Mendez, a former CIA agent. Yeah, well, now we're just getting repetitive. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, What's our second P? Uh, which plays into that uh, pace. Pace. Because, I mean, everyone who's talked to me ever knows that Kirk talks fast. That's not intentional. It's just that's that's my neutral. Um, most people talk. Uh, I used to know these numbers off the top of my head. I'm not going to pretend I do at the moment. Most people talk at X number of minutes, uh, words per minute. And I talk about 30 percent faster. And that's not intentional. It's just I happen to talk fast. Yeah, I will say for anyone who's listened to the podcast, whatever your opinion on Kirk's pace is, he has slowed way down for this. In in real yeah. life, he yeah. goes faster. This is and it's fun. Like and and lots of that becomes from I, I'm a Dinfos trained killer, and we will talk about what that means here in a second. But yeah, so pace, pace is is it's that simple. It's are you talking really fast and having lots of energy and infusion? Like, hey man, we should go to the beach and have all this fun, or are you talking with slow and deliberation? So the Chris Voss uh, hostage negotiator voice is the the late night sexy DJ voice is both lower. And so and I guess uh, it's important to note here that for pace doesn't involve pauses mm-hmm. like I, at a slower pace, my words are drawn out, but there's still no gaps between them. If I start talking faster, there's less gaps, but I'm still talking at a faster pace and there's not little. little and gaps. the words themselves are shorter. shorter like, like, yeah. so not only are the not only are there less gaps between them, but, you know, you're not saying like you're saying like. You know, uh, you're saying you're clipping the words down, you're clipping the gaps and you're just increasing the rate um, without dramatic pauses. But you mm-hmm. like you're uh, so there's a line from Chris Voss's book where he's like, I want to talk to the other guy. He's like, this is Chris. You're talking to me now. <laughs> like, and that's <laughs> such a good book, guys. You should read it. Never split the difference. Screw my book. Read that one. Anyway. Um, so what's number three? Pitch, pace, poise, poise, poise is the hardest to explain, but everyone gets it like it's the heart. It's basically acting. It's if I am addressing you and and I am going to change my body posture here for those who are watching. You'll see it for those who are listening. It does involve some posture, but I am only referring to the vocal. It's that it's it's a different vocal tone. So, yes, it plays into pitch a little bit and a pace a little bit. But if I am talking up here with um, good morning, children. You're listening to Radio Free Harvard on a chilly November morning. You're at the greatest university on earth, and you know what? You're in over your head. You're drowning. Especially you seniors with 180 days left till your thesis is due, and the powers that be determine whether you're destined for greatness or mediocrity. That has a poise to it. It's but not- I could also be very, very informal. And that's not just the words you're using, but it's the it's the timbre of your voice, the poise of your voice. Yeah, this one's the hardest one because pace. I understand the difference between fast and slow, but poise to me is Mary Poppins. Like, you know, she has poise. But if you say, well, what's the op- the the absence of it? I have a hard time defining. That. OK, well, think about it. This one's really the best person that I can think of this uh the best person that I can think of, and basically you could use anyone, but think Barack Obama for a second. Yeah. Think about literally any speech you see, say, you know, from yes, we can to his inauguration to any speech. Now think about him in any interview. Was it the same voice? No, it was not. Yeah, it wasn't. The the pitch was not different. The pitch was a little different. The pace was a little different. But the thing that the thing that Barack Obama, his his poise was palpable you could his poise like you know yes we can yes we can and then but then i did and he had a very different very in his poise changed it didn't become less presidential it didn't become it just 
between formal and informal, there was an entirely different poise. He absolutely had a don't make me come in there kind of. And I mean, that as a positive. Like when he gave addresses, you were like, I'm listening. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Like he, he had a very commanding poise when addressing people. But when talking, he was actually very affable seeming. Mm-hmm. Um, that's so poise. Here you're saying that's that's the turning up the poise and, and, and down again. That's yeah. that's poise is 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 it tone? Is it fast, slow? Is it? Yes, maybe a little bit, but no, there's a there's a poise to the voice. And yes, it usually accompanies a body posture. But no, we're talking about the vocal tone. OK, that, that makes more sense. Yeah. Um, pitch, pace, poise, pause. Now, pause. this one is William Shatner. He has it crushed like he's he's killing it. Um, pause. Oh, well, everyone understands pause. I mean, pause gets used a lot. It's you know, there's dramatic pause, pause for effect, pause for, you know, laughter. Pause. But. I would say that nobody does pause quite so well as any president ever. And we're going to show some examples in the second section that will help me do that. But pausing is just when you're letting your audience know which parts are important. Yeah. When you're talking about Obama's speech voice, uh, I I get the the poise part of it. Yeah. But no, pause is a big part of that, too. Yeah. No. and, And like I said. All of these are inter- like it's very hard to just none- do one. <laughs> like that's why it's like the Chris Voss thing. It's both pitch and pace. It's it's yeah, you can't just we're, we're trying to untangle the spaghetti here, and it's a little bit of an artificial. But, yeah, exactly. It's a little bit. They're all kind of connected. And then the last one um, is punch, and that is to say putting the emphasis where you need it. And you can do that like I just did with emphasis, or you can do it with volume, or you can do it with but punch is is literally just putting uh putting the like that is what i am talking about or like yes right there like there's there's so many ways to do punch but it's to to emphasize pieces in whatever means you you like with with a little bit of punch all right so walk me through them again pitch pitch pace pace poise poise pause pause punch pause punch now, I will say that many vocal people and other people, if we have any watching, are like, he forgot projection. No, he didn't. I uh, just to cover it really quick. I don't include projection. Projection is like if you're talking, if you're projecting or not, I consider that more of a stage thing than it is a persuasive or oration. Thing. It feels to me like that's something that you can overlay on top of any all of, of them. Things. Right. I, yeah. People are like, no, that's that's part of it. And it's like and whereas I get that, I, I very much consider that a separate thing. It doesn't go into how you're speaking. It goes into how you're speaking, which is, you know. All right. Well, we are going to take a break (laughs) and be back in just a minute. (laughs) Hey, Jeff and I wanted to take a minute just here at the top of the show to say thank you for joining us on our new podcast and YouTube show, Release the Creative. Whether you're new to our brand of crazy or you followed us over from one of our other social media platforms, LinkedIn, Twitch, Facebook, or Twitter, we'd like to thank you for joining us here. Please take this moment to hit the subscribe and the like button and also that funny little notification button so that you can be uh, notified of all our new episodes. We're really trying to get this new show up on the road. Thank you so much for watching. And we're back talking about all the peas. Now, we just said it's hard to separate these yeah. apart. Let's yeah. let's put them back together. What what do they what do they look like all together? No, uh, so when we have a lot of examples here, but I will actually say the reason I've chosen this first clip, it's a Mehdi Hassan clip. If you are unfamiliar, he's a British journalist, uh, devout, uh, uh, Muslim, really cool British national speaker, uh, writer, awesome guy. And yes, it's very hard to. Uh, it's not only really hard to disentangle all five of the peas, but in my experience, it's also really, really uncommon that you will find someone using all five close together. Like it just doesn't happen very often because if a presidential is giving a speech, he's giving a presidential speech. If a journalist is giving a speech, he's giving a journalistic speech. So typically, unless it's a stand up comedian doing a very kind of specific routine, but now that's more of a performance and we can talk about the difference between performance and speeches. But yeah. This speech of of uh, Mehdi Hassan doing uh, a kind of a debate-ish type thing at Oxford, I was like, I love it. I love it because he cycles through all of them a lot. Like you can hear the times that he's changing his vocal tones. You can see the times that he uses definitive changes in poise. And we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna break it all apart. And let's take a look. Yeah, it's awesome. Other people's branding, Oxford. I assume that Oxford is not going to sue me. Oh. 
So we're going to talk over it for a Thank second. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Assalamu alaikum. Lovely to see you all here tonight. We are having a very entertaining night, are we not? With some very interesting things being said. Just notice uh, that he's just... From the other side of the house tonight, um, let me begin by saying, as a Muslim, as a representative of Islam, I would consider myself an ambassador for Islam, a believer in Islam, a follower of Islam and its prophet. So in it's that doing capacity- doing what I call like micro pauses. Like they're very, they're very short, but they're pauses. They're pauses and he was changing the prepositions with these with these cool, he was changing his tone. He he, he flicked it up the, the pitch a couple times. He's like, I'm a follower of Islam. I believe we're in it Islam. It reminds like, me of songs where they skip a beat on purpose. And yeah, and, and he's doing it in this way that it's using everything from the pause to the tone he's using. I was like, like I, I got a little bit of a crush on him, like <laughs> because he's doing it, so, he's, and I'm not even done. I'm not even done my favorite part yet. Let me begin by apologizing to Anne-Marie for the Bali bombings. I apologize for the role of my religion down. and me and my people uh, just for the killing of Theo Van Gogh for 7-7. Seven, seven. Yes, that was all of us. That was Islam. That was Muslims. That was the Quran. I mean, astonishing, astonishing claims. Uh, to make in the very first speech tonight on a day like today. I love, and I'm, I'm not trying to wax political with this particular thing, but it's, he's speaking very lightly about something that very clearly bothers him, and he's doing it very, but he's doing it in a way that is that is neither uh, apologetic nor, I mean, he actually did apologize, so I guess it was apologetic, but you get my point. Like, it was very tongue-in-cheek. It's... But you can literally hear his voice traveling around his mouth from deeper to faster to slower. Mm -hmm. It's still getting in my head apart. Where the conservative prime minister of the United Kingdom is having to come out and point out that these kind of views are anathema. And I believe you're trying to- uh, Bonus points for using the word anathema in context and correctly. <laughs> I believe you're trying to stand for the Labour Party to become an MP in Brighton. If you do uh, and you make these comments, I'm guessing you'll have the whip withdrawn from you. But then again, UKIP's on the rise. They'll take you, the BNP. They might have uh, something to say about your views. This is what Mehdi Hassan always does. By the way, by the way, by the way. Okay, so I just want to say, this is my favorite part because in the next one minute, he will cycle about three times through all five. He will change his pitch, he will do definitive pauses, he will change his tone and his poise to one, uh, w I'm, gonna, I'm gonna say it up front, when he, go, when he does the years, uh, when he does the years, that is the best example for you of what to change poise means. You'll go, oh, that's changing poise, and, it's, right. and he does it with a light switch, and it's beautiful, so here it is. By the way, by the way, just on a factual point, since we heard a lot about the second speaker, about how backward we Muslims all are, on a factual point, you said that Islam was born in Saudi Arabia. Islam was born in 610 AD. Saudi Arabia was born in 1932 AD. So you were only 1,300. That's a change in poise. Did you see it? Which part? Ah, so he's like, he's like, hmm, I'm actually going to back it up and we're going to do it again because I want you to see this. By the way, I'm a librarian, I'm a historian. By the way, historian. By the way just on a factual historian. point, since we heard a lot about the second speaker, about how backward we Muslims all are. On a factual point, you said that Islam was born in Saudi Arabia. Islam was born in 610 AD. Saudi Arabia was born in now. 1932 AD. So you were only 1,300. So it's like a, um, almost like he changed from a, uh, changed. a reverent to a professor lecture. Right, yeah. he changed, he's like, he's like, yeah, so he's like, you know, uh, Saudi Arabia, you know, Islam was born in 610 uh, AD, Saudi Arabia was born in 1932. Like completely different poise, completely different stature. He literally dropped his shoulders. Again, I am talking about his voice, but he changed everything on a light switch and then popped right back. And 22 years off, not bad, not bad start there. Uh, talking of maths, by the way, a man named Al Qawarizmi was one of the greatest mathematicians of all time, a Muslim, worked in the golden age of Islam. He's the guy who came up with not just algebra, but algorithms. Without algorithms, you wouldn't have a laptop. By the way, I only learned that algebra and algorithms came from the same root word like six months ago. I've never thought about it, so I guess you're ahead of me. <laughs> Without laptops, Daniel Johnson tonight wouldn't have been able to print out his speech in which he came to berate us Muslims for holding back the advance and intellectual achievements of the West, which all happened without any contribution from anyone else other than the Judeo-Christian people of Europe. In fact, Daniel David Levering, the author of the Pulitzer Prize winning historian and author of The Golden Crucible, points out that there would be no Renaissance, there would be no Reformation in Europe without the role played by Ibn Sina and Ibn Rushd and some of the great Muslim theologians, philosophers, scientists in bringing Greek text. Okay. In that short clip, 
He went up to nearly yelling, quite frantic, quite excited, high energy several times. He changed. He went back down to slow and very pointed, very deep and very thoughtful. He changed his literal posture and poise several times and all of it within the keeping of one concept. So it, it isn't that any of these are are, well, that's more of a this or that's more of a that. It's you can always use them. But I love this because he's very animated, but he's also very controlled. And you can tell I'm not saying he rehearsed this. I, I really don't know. But you can tell that it was very thoughtful rehearsed. I don't know. Intentional very clearly. Yeah. And that's uh, and he's working the audience. He's working that he's playing that vibe. And that's a good thing. I mean, everything I've just said, I meant entirely positively. But what I want to get to is he's the example of the uh, the gamut. What we're far more used to seeing is this. So first of all, let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Nameless, unreasoning, unjustified terror, which paralyzes needed efforts to convert retreat into advance. Yep. So that's the template for uh, most presidents since then, isn't it? it? It really, really is. And I mean, that's not the oldest uh, presidential thing I could find, but it uh, probably pretty close. Um, it's it's amazing from him all the way to Barack Obama, which is the last one we'll watch. He, that is the template for presidential speaking. It is low. It is slow. Mm -hmm. It has lots of so back to my 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 teacher Mark, who was trying, who was told he had to do you know uh, Eastern Europe Eastern European surf music, and what was that supposed to sound like? If I want to sound presidential, it's easy. Sounding presidential, there is a template for it. Number two. Yesterday, December seventh, nineteen forty one. A date which will live in infamy. Number three. We have been compelled to create a permanent armaments industry of vast proportions. In the councils of government, we must car guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence. Number four. I do not believe. Oh, sorry. Preface. This is the first one to break from it. And that is why what's very interesting is so the the, the fun thing about uh, JFK yeah. is that he is said to be one of the, the first television president. And that is, depending on how you ask, that's a pejorative term or not, which is to say that before that, it was always really, really about uh, the politics. But JFK was the first one where the uh, the debates were televised and you had you know, Richard Nixon in a brown suit and a brown tie. And then you had pretty boy over here in a blue tie, uh, you know, and he was just more fun to look at gay, straight, whatever. Like, just like, that's my president. Like his politics. It's, it's when, you know, it's when television started. It, it, it's when it started to be a little bit more. And what's interesting is at the same time, he's one of the very first people that his speeches stopped being that template. Now he has speeches that match that template. He absolutely does. But he, most of his speeches sound more like this. That any of us would exchange places with any other people or any other generation. Lots of pauses still. The energy, the faith, the devotion, which we bring to this endeavor will light our country and all who serve it. There is so much youth in his voice. It's a, it still has the same low. It still has the same slow. But it is not the same poise. It's a lot more punch. It's a lot more punch. It has a completely different. It has a youthful energy compared to the other ones, which were all <laughs> very Montgomery Burns till we yeah. get to, to to JFK. I thought you'd appreciate that reference. <laughs> and the glow from that fire can truly light the world. And so, my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you ask what you can do for your country now obviously we've all heard that quote 13 trillion times but i don't want to talk about the quote i want to talk about when he chose to punch mm -hmm. pace put and so Pause. everyone's listening my fellow americans ask not punch what uh, your country can do for you 
but what you can do for your country. It was a very accusatory, but not in a negative way. It was a very, it, it changed the onus. It changed the, it. It was a, it was very deliberately paced, punched and paused. And it was very presidential, but not like we had really seen mm -hmm. from, uh, you know, at, you know, all we have to fear is fear itself. December 7th, 1941, that all these very, no matter how emotional, he's the first person to really punch it as a president. My historians are freaking out right now. Yes, I'm aware of the other examples. I'm just saying as a, as a as a, you know. And now let's leave president and just go to civil leader. And we obviously everyone's heard this one, but he's borrowing a lot of the same. Uh, this is JFK. I'm sorry. This is Martin Luther King, MLK. This is Martin Luther King Jr. And of course, the the I have a dream speech. He's borrowing some of those same. It's low. It's slow. Lots of breaks. Now, if I was going to do a much longer thing, we could get into the pastoral and how there's a lot of reverend in this because, yes, he was one. But there are a few differences between uh, clerical and and political. But he's he's doing an interesting hybrid. Oh, my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin but by the content of their character i have a dream today so you hear the sing song yeah so it's still low and slow like the presidential because he's wanting to be but he's added a different poise to it he's added it there's literal a it's almost like he's singing in a very positive way. That's a very cl clerical uh, thing. That's a very, uh, especially Southern Baptist. It has a, it has a very, that tone and timbre to it. It was something that his audience specifically was going to feel uh, motivated and, and uh, activated by. So this is our last clip, and it's really, really long. We're not going to watch the whole thing. It's his entire inaugural. It's his, it's his, it's his entire 2008 inauguration. So no, we're not doing that. But. Obama is is one of my favorite speakers that I've ever seen personally. He is such an amazing use of all five. Lots of presidents didn't. Lots of presidents had a brand. Well, every president has a brand, but lot. But his brand included all five of these things. Um, not always in speeches, but his inauguration, uh, his inaugural speech, I think was was really really something. And here it is. Maybe. Yeah, here it is. And all those watching tonight from beyond our shores, Pause. from parliaments and palaces, to those who are huddled around radios in the forgotten corners of the world, Pause. our stories are singular, but our destiny is shared. And a new dawn of American leadership is at hand. <laughs> to, those, to those who would tear the world down, we will defeat you. To those who seek peace rising. and security, we support you. And to all those who have wondered if America's beacon still burns as bright, tonight we proved once more that the true strength of our nation comes not from the might of our arms or the scale of our wealth, but from the enduring power of our ideals, democracy, liberty, opportunity, and unyielding hope. The place. The place. The poise changed. He went higher in his voice. He did not go lower. One more phrase. That's the true genius of America. He went up, rising action, rising action, rising action, rising action. Let them clap. And when he came back, he was a full octave lower, a full beat slower, and he hit him. That's the full genius of America. And it's it's straight ev evocation. It's if you can master these things, you can play people like you have a game controller on them. And I don't mean play people in a negative sense. I'm just saying that true oration and obviously because of the, the confines of the show, I had to pull from public sources and speeches. But a lot of these same exact things, all of these were public speaking examples, but these all absolutely these exact same things, pitch, pace, poise, pause and punch also work in interpersonal and just talking. If you are going to go to a friend, uh, you know, interventionally or or ask a girl on a date or boy on a date. All of these things matter how you poise, how you posture, how you you can make people feel very uncomfortable or very comfortable. You can make people feel very good or very bad. 
saying the exact same words, but just changing the pitch, the pace, the poise, the pause, and 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 you shouldn't you shouldn't punch people. I, I've been told. <laughs> so should people uh, go practice all these this weekend? Because when you had me try them, I I learned something about myself. It's it's I, I'd say try like one at a time. It's a lot. Um, I I I learned these. Uh, I've always been a speaker. I've been a speaker my whole life. But I actually learned this format at uh, the Defense Information School, which is a a. a so I'm an Army journalist, or I was an Army journalist, and. Uh, we, they sent us to Dinfos, as, as it is so called, and and the graduates of such the, the institution are called the Dinfos trained killers because we're journalists in the army or the military. So it's kind of a joke amongst the Dinfos trained killers. Uh, but yeah, pick one at a, one at a time, and if if you find that you're always talking a little too fast, work on the the pacing and just think to yourself deliberately, as I do when we are recording these. I am going to talk slower. I am. I am going to talk slower. Yeah, I think everyone has their telephone voice, and it's that's that's unintentional, but for most people, but it's so uh, fun to listen to. But uh, we all do it, and once you once you realize that you have a different voice, it's a little bit easier to then come up with a third and a fourth. No, and so the telephone voice, I, the telephone. That's a really good example. Most people I know, most people I know, don't like phone work, which is to say they don't like calling their bank. They don't like calling their doctor. They don't like calling their insurance agent. Yeah. Uh, they, they don't like calling those types of places. Because I order Chinese food from a particular restaurant specifically because they let me order online. <laughs> That's funny. Um, I love it. I mean, I don't love needing to call them, but I discovered many years ago that because of this, the second you get rid of body language and you have nothing but the voice, it makes this a lot easier. And over the phone, if you pl- use really, really basic principles of communication and all of these pos- of, you know, put your mouth a little closer, drop it back and talk a little slower, make joke. You can you can get things from someone over the phone. Like there's a the reason they're trying to go to AI, because I get things over the phone that people are not supposed to get <laughs> because I ask nicely. But there's more to it than that. Um, and it's this. It's it's what pitch you're using and why. How are you pacing it? Are you talking really, really fast? Pitch, pace, poise, pause, and punch. And how does this relate to creativity? It's a lot of times the way that we talk is what's holding us back. It's is we can't get our ideas out, or if we can, no one listens because we're not articulating it correctly. Or even if we're saying the right words, we're not saying the words right. And we need to be aware of that. And for, you said creativity, for people writing fictional characters, uh, don't just think, oh, well, this guy is a pilot, <laughs> you know, like uh, think about all of these th- right factors in their voice. And that helps you write how they might talk. Yeah. No, I mean, even if it's not a, even that yeah, not, it's not a screenplay, this isn't casting. If you're writing a novel when the pilot speaks and think about that for a second, think about how common uh, uh, vocational colloquialisms is. All pilots sound the same. All of them. You know why that is? Go for it. That's because of Chuck Yeager. <laughs> You know this one? No. Oh, yeah. Chuck Yeager is a hero, and uh, he's the first man to break the sound barrier. He's from West Virginia, and he has a, uh, a particular accent, and he became very famous among pilots. I don't know if the effect has diminished now, but through the last half of the 20th century, uh, if you wanted to be just a you know, United Airlines pilot or an F-14 pilot, if you were a pilot, you Had wanted an accent. to talk like Chuck Yeager because he was the gold standard and that's why when the airplane lands and they say we're descending into uh, orlando if you look out the left side of your plane you'll see that that's a that's a, that that pitch pace poise pause punch they're that, doing chuck yeager <laughs> really yeah no i had no idea no that's real <laughs> oh that's cool and then yeah he's like yes we're descending to orlando we're gonna, we're, we're gonna be at about thirty-four thousand feet today we're pretty uh pretty comfy it's, rise it's not that they all copied him it's that when you got the job you started talking like the other pilots right you no. know it just spreads well no and, and i could do a whole episode on on what's uh dialect reflection which is to say you always tend to copy other people that you're talking to but uh that's fascinating i did not know that yeah you have to look up uh i'm i'm sure search a youtube i've read it in books um but i bet if you look on youtube there's probably that's really cool specific examples of it no and it's just the way that i like to use this in communications really boils down to the simple fact of of this and just like eastern uh eastern european uh beach music surf music has a sound and presidents have a sound and and 1920s radio announcers have a sound if you can 
tap into the emotional uh, currency that is tied into these things. Ask not what your country can do for you. If you can, I'm not saying go around doing impressions, by the way, not not the point here. But if you can tap into these these evocations, what makes each one what it is. If presidential means t- speaking slow, low, and deliberate, and you need to talk to someone and you want them to feel you are authoritative, then you talk low, slow, and deliberate. If you want to infuse someone with fun and no, oh, we're going to have a great time. It's going to be a great. You, we are so much programming and we are so much history. All of us, we have, communication is really hard. So the quickest way to get someone where you need them mentally is to mirror an evocation that they already have. If, if presidents will, if, if pilots are truck Yeager, Hey, I want them to think of me as a pilot. Then, uh, when I get on the radio, Hey, uh, Hey folks, uh, Hey folks, this is the, this is the pilot up in the crew. Right? They all have that same timbre. I didn't know that they were copying, but whether or not it was one person, 50, 60, oh my gosh, almost a hundred years ago, <laughs> yeah. um, 80, yeah. 80 years ago, it becomes a, this sounds like this. So if you want to be that sound like it, there's a lot of power there into copying and there's a lot of power into going against it because going against the evocation can be just as powerful if you do it correctly <laughs> and at the right times. That might be a subject for another whole podcast. It, it, it super, super duper is. But uh, for today, I think we've done enough peas and yeah. uh, let everybody get on with their day. Uh, thanks for joining us here at Release the Creative. And uh, if you're listening to the podcast, check us out on YouTube. And if you're watching this on YouTube, check out the podcast. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Thanks for joining us here at Release the Creative. Kirk here would never say it to your face, but he thinks you should like and subscribe to us on YouTube. And Jeff is far too shy to admit it, but he thinks you should subscribe to us on your favorite podcast reader. Yeah, well, you're the one who's always saying that everyone should give us five stars on Apple Podcasts. Why do you have to make everything so difficult?